Hello, and welcome to World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr, and we're coming to you from the Senate Chamber of the Old Capitol Museum on the Central Campus. This is World Canvas, uh, Child Protection, a Global Responsibility, part of the 2014 University of Iowa Provost Global Forum, whose focus is child abuse and neglect. Uh, as we know, child abuse and neglect are global realities, and they affect not only children, but the adults they become and the societies in which they live. In the remaining two programs in this four-part series, we're going to look at the responses to abuse and neglect, first here in the U.S. and finally in two other nations as case studies, Turkey and Portugal. So here to talk with us about the national and regional response to child abuse and neglect in the U.S. are Dr. Regina Buttress, Medical Director of the Child Protection Center, Unity Point Health, St. Luke's Hospital in Hiawatha, Iowa. Dr. Buttress, thank you for being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And next to her is Chris Corkin, First Assistant Dubuque County Attorney in Dubuque, Iowa. And thank you, Chris, for driving down today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we have Dr. Resmi Oral, Professor of Pediatrics and Director of the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics Child Protection Program. Welcome, Resmi. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to start with Dr. Buttress. And, um, you're the medical director of a child protection center. Uh, what is a child protection center, and how did these centers come about? Well, a child protection center is a place where you can bring a child for evaluation and treatment of possible abuse. And typically, there's a multidisciplinary approach to the evaluation. So it would include a medical provider, a forensic interviewer for fact finding, and law enforcement, as well as child protective services. Uh, in addition, there may be uh, prosecution or mental health providers involved and advocacy, family advocacy, and victim advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, in our situation in, at St. Luke's, our center became because there was a local need for a place for kids to go. And a task force was started and gathered about 25 people who felt it was important that we have a place where these kids could go professionals could come together to evaluate these children and have the best outcome for them. And so they gathered the people to the table and talked about how to establish the program, which started about 27 years ago. Mm -hmm. After that, uh, it, it was realized that one center in Iowa would not cover the whole state, so other centers started opening after that. And currently we have seven centers in the state that can evaluate children for abuse. Mm -hmm. And the children come to you how? At our center, we take our referrals from Child Protective Services and law enforcement in general. Those children would receive a medical evaluation and also a forensic interview. We do also offer um, just medical evaluations, which are referrals from medical providers. And those are generally just uh, a second opinion or maybe a concern about the child where they want to have someone do a medical evaluation and see what might need, be needed. Mm -hmm. So there isn't necessarily a, a legal element to this, or, or there would be. A child would have been found to be in potential harm, serious harm, in order to be referred on to you. The legal part would be the law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And then from there, once the child is seen and we perform our medical exam and the forensic interview, law enforcement and Child Protective Services take their case from there, continue their investigation or assessment, and once they have their entire investigation finished, then they would take it to their county attorney mm -hmm. and see what else might need to be done or where the case would go from there. I see, I see. Well, maybe we should continue then with you, Chris, to, to ask from the county attorney's point of view um, what happens uh, when you hear from a child protection center. Well, we've, um, we've used uh, child protection centers since they've opened. I've been uh, prosecuting for about 36 years. And we've been doing multidisciplinary in our office for about um, 25 years. Um, so we're very frequent visitors to the St. Luke Center. It's the closest one for us. It's also the gold standard we <laughs> consider in the state, I might add. Um, but from our standpoint, it provides us with a better possibility for prosecution. Um, one of the benefits of the Child Protection Center is that the interviews are done by trained forensic interviewers which means our children are only interviewed once. Um, not by police, not by family members, not by a loving grandma. It's the forensic interviewer who was trained in the developmental levels of how children speak, how they understand, how they think, 
And so we only have our children interviewed once, which is good for the child, but frankly, it's also just as good for the prosecution because we only have one version we have to turn over to the defense. Mm -hmm. The other benefit it provides to us is that they are, uh, they are not only better interviews, but they're recorded. They're videotaped and documented. So we have that interview as part of our case file, if you will. Mm -hmm. And those are extremely valuable. When we show uh, a reluctant perpetrator, oh, nobody's going to believe that child opposed to, uh, as opposed to myself, and we show the perpetrator with his attorney the child's statement, the interview done, um, we're very successful in getting guilty pleas because it is a very compelling uh, sight for the, for the defendant to look at. And the other, the other reason is, frankly, they're child friendly. They're, they're centers where children feel comfortable. I have every faith in our law enforcement. Our law enforcement do consider themselves and are wonderful advocates for children. Mm -hmm. But law enforcement wear blue uniforms and badges and guns on their hips. And for a good portion of the kids that they talk to, when a policeman comes to the door, nothing good happens. Mm -hmm. Only bad things happen. And so if we can put the child in a setting outside of a police station where they're comfortable, where they're safe, where they refer to the people as the nice ladies I talk to, mm -hmm. then we, we get a much better interview from the child. Not just because of the questioning being better, but because the child is more comfortable. And the focus of this entire process needs to always be on what is best for the child. I don't care if I hurt the officer's feelings by telling him, no, I'm not going to let you talk to her. I care about the fact that I want this child healthy, I want this child protected, and I'm going to do the best thing I can do to make that happen. And the child protection centers are really the key for us. Mm -hmm. Boy, um, uh, Resmia, I know you've worked with these child protection centers for a very long time. You also, as I understand it, uh, offer um, uh, professional testimony when there are cases happening around the state. And um, yes. uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how all of that works. Um, if you're called in to, to say something in a prosecution? Um, well, I testify in court once or twice a month, uh, I would say on average. Um, most of the cases that I am involved in are severe physical abuse cases, criminal neglect cases, sometimes what is called Munchausen syndrome by proxy cases in which parents either fabricate or Ill induce illness in their children to be able to obtain medical care. Those are the kinds of cases that uh, I get involved in most because um, there is a system in our state, uh, all sexual, allegedly sexual abuse cases are referred to uh, child protection centers. And at our hospital as well, at the University of Iowa, other than acute sexual assault cases, we do not manage uh, any such cases uh, that we know sexual abuse has occurred. Those are reported to DHS and referred to St. Luke's Child Protection Center. But in the other cases, because the University of Iowa Hospital is uh, one of the two tertiary hospitals in the state, all severe uh, cases, injury cases, come to the University of Iowa. As a result, uh, I get involved and I testify in court very frequently. And, and also, if I may add, um, uh, from Dubuque and from other locations, uh, we do go to St. Luke's for our sex abuse and, so, and minor, what I would refer to as minor, child abuse. Uh, serious physical injury, however, we do send our children to Iowa City for the medical care, and we use the Child Protection Center facilities at the University of Iowa hospitals. Mm -hmm. So we have the same benefit. We have the same interviewing. We have the same setting. It's just done in an in-hospital setting, mm -hmm. and then Dr. O'Rell will schedule a multidisciplinary team meeting mm -hmm. for all of the participants in that case to start making some good decisions. Yeah. So we're, we're very fortunate to have, to have not only the University of Iowa Hospital from a medical standpoint, mm -hmm. but to have University of Iowa Hospitals for the Child Protection Center as well. Yeah. And in some of those cases, I apologize, mm -hmm. uh, some older physically abused children when forensic uh, interview was needed but the child uh, wasn't able to go to St. Luke's Child Protection Center, uh, Dr. Buttress and her team have been very gracious to send down forensic interviewers from her setting to the University of Iowa and those children were interviewed in my clinic with very little discomfort to them. 
Yeah. Which I'm very grateful for. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk just a little bit about these multidisciplinary teams. You, you have named uh, all or the majority of the different sorts of people who would be involved in assessing a child's needs. But what really is, why is it important to have a multidisciplinary team? I'll ask you, Dr. Rob. Well, uh, as my colleagues reported here, I call Chris my colleague as well, from Child Protection Common Denominator, uh, multidisciplinary approach to child abuse and neglect is extremely important because child abuse diagnoses occurs in one setting, child protection occurs in another facility, litigation um, or protection uh, of the case at the legal arena occurs in yet another setting, prevention uh, is taken care of by yet another uh, set of people. As a result, uh, my mentor, Charles Johnson, uh, had likened child abuse and neglect management to relay race. Uh, one person starts with the baton, runs a certain distance, then has to pass the baton to the next agency. And if that baton is dropped, the race is lost. Mm -hmm. And what's lost, actually, is the child's best interest at that point. So as a result, we have to work together. And I'm very fortunate to report, and uh, I'm happy to report that we are fortunate in Iowa we all know the value of this multidisciplinary response and working together. At my sitting, for instance, the multidisciplinary team is established on an ad hoc basis, case by case basis, pretty much. In the intensive care unit, there's a shaken baby with abuse of head trauma. Uh, the child protection team is there. Treating physicians are there. Uh, we call DHS, Department of Human Services, they come to the hospital, law enforcement follows. In most severe cases, uh, Ms. Corkin and other prosecutors have also come to the hospital mm -hmm. to build that multidisciplinary team and response uh, to understand the medical facts about a child's situation, uh, the, um, the parameters of uh, child protection issues, and whether there will be a criminal case or not uh, and everybody learns from one another in that kind of an environment, and I'm pretty sure Gina will tell more about how they do uh, sexual abuse management. At the Child Protection Center, everyone comes to the table for the appointment, so we have the child protective worker, law enforcement, the interviewer, and myself, and our family advocate all there, so we can directly communicate with each other at the time, and like Resni said, if there's any questions or concerns, uh, then you can talk about them at the time. And I can talk about my examination and answer questions about that. We talk to the family and let them know where things go from there. So the families leave knowing, okay, law enforcement's going to do this and DHS is going to do this. And if there's medical follow-up needed, here's what it is. Our family advocate will help with follow-up for therapy or other needs that the family has. So there's not all the different services trying to do their job and maybe overlapping or not completing their job, everyone knows at the end of the appointment what everyone's duties are at that time. And, and I think um, from the criminal prosecution standpoint, um, I want to make the very best decision I can make for the safety of the child, the safety of the community, and I need as much information as I can get to make that decision. And it isn't that groups don't do their own, own job well, they do, but they don't necessarily share information. And that's the benefit of the multidisciplinary. I want to know what the police think, but I also want to know what the doctors think, and I want to know what DHS thinks. And I want to then use all of that information in making the best possible decision that I can make. And I think that's the only responsible thing to do. Criminal prosecution is a huge hammer, and you need to use it well, and you need to use it with a focus on how to do the best mm -hmm. job possible. And you simply cannot do that without all of the information. It yeah. just can't be done. Yeah. And we've been talking about the child, but what ages are we talking about? Is this up to 18? or, or I... At our center, we see up to <coughs> age 18 when we consider children, but we also see developmentally delayed adults as well. So we yeah. will see adults if they have developmental delays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, at what point is uh, a child of whatever age uh, removed from a, a family? 
Um, if, there is, if there's someone in a family uh, that seems to be responsible and, and clearly you know, wants to work with uh, advocates and so on, um, I know there's no way to really generalize about this, but I wonder if you can, can help us understand um, when a child's uh, best interest seems to be to, to put them in another, a, another location rather than the home they've grown up in. That's a, that would seem to me to be a very distressing thing too, however, however dysfunctional the home might be. It's a big change in that child's life. And um, maybe you can give me a, a perspective on how these decisions are made. Well, that's very controversial. Yeah. Um, and I'm telling you right now, I'm speaking as a prosecutor. I've only always been a prosecutor, so that's my bias. Mm -hmm. um, but our primary concern is the safety of the child. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, I don't care about hurting somebody's feelings. I care about how that child will be safe. If I believe the child can remain in the home safe with a supportive adult, then I, I, we will acquiesce to that. But if there are criminal charges, we will get a no contact order mm. preventing the offender from having any contact. The problem is there may be a non-offending parent in the home whose allegiance is greater to the offender than to the child. Yeah. And although they are not offenders, that is extremely dangerous. And in fact, from my standpoint, almost mo more dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so we will then make an effort to remove the child from that parent mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes taking children out of their mm -hmm. homes. None of us do. But our focal point is protecting the child and doing what's best for the child. And as I said, however, it is very controversial. And mm -hmm. we, we fight these battles all the time. There is no set answer. But, but that is our primary goal. And uh, just to add a couple of words, uh, Department of Human Services has a very comprehensive safety assessment tool. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, we physicians do not make the decision about removal, even recommendation. Rarely I feel uh, or I, I am compelled to make a recommendation to DHS. We really feel this child is not safe. Uh, as a result of some of the observations we may make at the hospital, the partners fighting in the child's room, or uh, just as uh, Chris reported, sensing that the mother is siding with the offender rather than mm -hmm. uh, with the child. Uh, those are the rare situations we would recommend DHS consider removing this child from the family. Otherwise, it is DHS who reviews all of the risk factors in a family and establishes the level of risk. Hmm. So um, tell me a little bit about your, your medical practice, what, what you see as a doctor every day. Um, working with the Child Protection Centers, I don't know if you also have a part of your practice that is, uh, that is involved in you know, just seeing patients on a daily basis and if this is, so I don't know. Tell me a little bit about your professional life. Well, I spend about 34 hours a week at the Child Protection Center, so that is primarily what I do. And then I work at an urgent care uh, one evening a week generally. At our center, we see about 25 kids a week and about 1,000 kids a year. So in general, it's a full-time job between seeing kids and uh, working on prevention and advocacy and, mm -hmm. and those other areas in child protection. Mm -hmm. And when you say 25 kids a week, those are, are first, first time you see these kids, or that's the number of appointments you would have? That's the number of appointments, and unfortunately, we do see kids back yeah. second, third, and fourth time yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But in general, we see 25 kids a week for exams and interviews, and so that's primarily what I do. Kind of heartbreaking, huh? This is very, very hard on you, I suspect. It can be sometimes, uh, but I work with a really great group of people, mm -hmm. and we're very supportive of each other, and our hospital supports us as well. And so we um, keep ourselves healthy by supporting each other. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Dr. Ra. Gina, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the family advocacy services through the Child Protection Center? I think it's one of the most important services. Yeah, it's very important. We have one full-time family advocate and are working on getting a second person. Our family advocate is involved through the entire process. Uh, so when we initially meet with the family, uh, during the forensic interview, they meet with the family separately to talk about uh, their concerns, their worries, answer their questions, and then they're there for our final meeting where we make our recommendations. Uh, most importantly, they follow up with the family. So they'll make a call the next day to the family and see how they're doing and how the child's doing after being at the center. Mm -hmm. And then they also help the family follow through with our recommendations. And a key to that is therapy. And uh, with the ACEs study and trauma-informed care, we focus on trauma-focused therapy, and so our family advocate has had um, 
linkage agreement set up with um, therapists. We serve 40 counties, so in about um, half or so of those counties should have been able to set up linkage agreements that therapists will get our kids in relatively quickly oh. within a couple of weeks. So therapists are very busy and sometimes backed up four to six weeks, but they've agreed to get our kids in relatively quickly so they can start therapy. So our family advocate will um, help families get the therapy set up and continue to interact with them as long as the families want to. And then if it does proceed to charges in court, then she'll help them through the um, court and testimony. Fortunately, we have a lot of victim advocates in the system, the court system, so she doesn't have to continue to interact with them. She can pass them off to the victim advocates as well. But she'll be there with them as long as they need uh, the support. Mm -hmm. So within the last 10, 15 years, you, you have been involved in this area and it's personal passion for a long time, Dr. Oral, <clears throat> professionally as well. Much has happened in the last few years. What do you hope will happen in the next, I don't know, 10 years in this, in this area? Oh, very good question. Um, I would like to answer this question in two parts. One, in the child protection field, um, I am hoping um, the child protection centers and child protection programs networks will uh, uh, kind of merge or uh, become more strongly uh, connected uh, to one another in collaboration. We are collaborating very significantly right now um, we have medical students, residents, international visitors at the University of Iowa. Dr. Buttress and her team have been extremely graceful and gracious to uh, accept all our trainees and uh, they're exposing them to the Child Protection Center model. Um, I am hoping there will be more collaboration uh, regarding uh, cross-sharing resources and helping each other out both in terms of training and research and um, activities, uh, professional activities, patient-related activities. Um, we are, as a state, working on looking at multidisciplinary response model in Iowa. Um, there is a research being done in that regard. I am hoping that is going to help us in that regard. Um, we are also... Um, in a new phase of responding to child abuse and neglect cases. Um, previously, we used to respond to all cases from the child abuse perspective, and child abuse assessments or investigations were being done. But now we have moved to a differential uh, response model, uh, which means some of the accepted cases will go into child abuse assessment path but a lot of uh, reported and accepted cases will go into family assessment path. Uh, we are yet to see the uh, pros and cons of these two responses, uh, but we are hopeful that uh, there will be good developments in that regard. Um, the second path is I am hoping uh, adverse childhood experiences screening, intervention, and providing trauma-informed care to all clients in the medical field, human resources, or human services field, education, employment, uh, juvenile delinquency setting, every setting that is imaginable, I am hoping trauma-informed care is going to start uh, ruling the land. And can I just add one thing, because <laughs> I wanted to raise that. In terms of the, the result of the multidisciplinary mindset, which I'll call it as opposed to just having your team, um, the Department of Corrections in the state of Iowa, the people that do probation and parole, are now incorporating trauma-informed care for women um, clients yeah. as part of their probation curriculum, as part of their uh, parole curriculum, and we're working very hard to get it into part of the prison mm -hmm. curriculum before the women come out. Because the idea of trauma-informed care is, is based out of a medical model, but it is also based on a how do we make you healthy and how do we make you healthy in the community, which makes the community healthier. healthier. And so we've incorporated that as an outreach from what started as a medical issue. Wow. 
Great work you're all doing. It's, it's inspiring to hear about this. Sad to hear about the, the issue and the problem, but really wonderful to see such creative minds working on all of this. And I want to thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Buttress. And thank you, Ms. Corkin. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Aral. Thank You've been you. listening to the third part of a four-part series on child protection, a global responsibility. This is World Canvas, and I'm Joan Kerr. I hope you can join us next time. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.